The numbers from various surveys vary, but researchers agree that somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of all people living today are living with some sort of mental health illness. 20 to 25 percent, that's a lot of people. You may be thinking to yourself, but I don't know anybody. That may be because people who are living with some sort of mental health challenge don't want to talk about it. There's too much stigma, stigma involved in it. Today, I want to talk about living with a mental illness and meditation and the ways meditation can be helpful in leading a healthier, fuller life. As I do that, I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel as well as to click the bell so you're notified of future videos. 20 to 25 percent. You know, out of the 20 to 25 percent, only about 40 percent, less than half, receive any kind of treatment. People who have some sort of mental health challenge are carrying a lot of pain. They're suffering and have heavy burdens that they bear. And that's part of why I want to talk about meditation, because meditation can be really helpful in enabling people to lead a healthier, happier, full, more content life. Now, I want to be very clear that meditation or prayer or any other spiritual practice aren't cures for any kind of mental illness. Proper treatment should be sought out. Proper treatment typically includes both medication as well as some sort of talk therapy. But along with that, doing things like having a healthy diet, exercising regularly, and meditation can really help people live well when they're living with some form of mental illness. Those mental illnesses include things like anxiety disorder, bipolar affect disorder, and depression, which is technically called a mood disorder. Those are the three main ones. But then there's also dissociative disorders, eating disorders, paranoia, psychosis, schizophrenia, and obsessive compulsive disorder. That's a lot. Meditation won't take it away, but meditation helps people live better. And you may be thinking, he's the spirituality guy. He thinks everybody should be meditating. And you're right, I do. But that's because there's a large body of scientific evidence that shows how beneficial meditation is for us. In particular, meditation helps our maintain good brain health. Brain health is really important if you're living with a mental disorder. It's helpful for all of us, but it's really going to be important if you have some sort of diagnosis. I talk about this in more detail in the video, Two Ways Spirituality Helps Ease Depression. But just as a quick summary, the way our brain functions is through the use of certain chemicals referred to as neurochemicals, brain chemicals, neurochemicals, and many of those are neurotransmitters. They're chemicals that help messages get sent from one cell to another in the brain so that our brain actually is working. Those chemicals include serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, neuroepinephrine, and GABA. When you practice meditation, the levels of those chemicals balance out in your brain so that your brain is able to function more effectively. You know, many people will say after they've done meditation that they feel less stress, they feel happier. Over time, they have an increase in contentment in life. That's because of what's happening in the brain. That's because these brain chemicals are evening out and being more accessible for their proper use. And this is really important for people living with some sort of mental health condition. Now, you know, most people who teach meditation teach meditation in a very similar way. They tell you to sit down, whether it's on the pillow, on the floor, or in a chair, and to plan on spending 20 minutes a day focused, sitting silently, doing meditation. If you're living with many mental health conditions, Asking you to sit quietly for 20 minutes is practically a kind of torture. It feels like your skin's crawling and you just want to jump up. It's not something that's going to work for you. So because of that, I want to talk about three keys, 
three keys that are going to be helpful to keep in mind as you consider incorporating uh, meditation into your life if you're living with some form of mental health disorder. The first key to remember if you're engaging in meditation, especially if you're living with a mental health challenge, has to do with distractions. Many people with a mental health uh, disorder, with a mental health challenge, view themselves as being more easily distracted than other people. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. We're not gonna try to sort that out right now. But distractions are really important in terms of looking at in terms of meditation. In meditation, you can't get rid of distractions. They're going to be there. They're going to be outside distractions and inside distractions. Outside distractions are, you know, a siren from the police going by, or a dog barking, or the cat knocking over a lamp, or a phone ringing, all those things outside of us that make noises or, or whatever is happening around us that will be distractions for us. Then there are in, internal distractions random thoughts that we have, sensations, feelings, uh, different things that come up for us, that distract us. You can't stop your brain. You can't turn off internal or external distractions, but you can manage them. And that's what meditation is really all about. When you realize that you're distracted, when you become aware of it, that's the key, when you become aware you need to use your meditation technique to bring you back into meditation. Your technique may be following your breathing as you exhale, repeating a word or a mantra on your breath. It may be looking at a lit candle, fixing your gaze on a statue or a picture. All of those different things are ways of anchoring us in meditation so that when you become aware of a distraction, you use that technique to bring you back, to keep your focus. Don't waste time trying to control distractions. Instead, when you're aware, bring yourself back. Eventually you'll be able to say, hey, that was a distraction, I'm back here now. Oh, there's another one, I'm back here now. And it will be fine, because that will be, you're moving further into meditation. So that's the first key, dealing with distractions. The second key, is that sitting meditation may not be what's right for you. Walking meditation may be preferable. Walking meditation is a technique that was popularized by Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh in his writings on mindfulness meditation. Walking meditation is simply walking slowly as you breathe. You take a breath, you take a step, and you generally keep your focus downward, gaze downward. And you do that and begin to get into a rhythm of meditation. You can include a, a, a word with that or following your breath, whatever. You can make it a little more complicated, but the simple form is one breath, one step. You can do that in your home. You can walk around a room a few times. You can do it outside. The advantage here is that if you have trouble sitting still, you can engage your body in meditation and do that in a very clear and helpful way. Another way of doing walking meditation is by using a labyrinth. A labyrinth is a geometric pattern, generally in a circle that's divided into four quadrants. And the path in the labyrinth, which is generally etched or painted on the pavement or the ground, leads you around those four quadrants. As you look at the pattern from outside the labyrinth, you can't really tell where the path's going to, how the path's going to get you to the center. When you're walking it, you keep your feet, your gaze focused on where you're walking to stay on the path, and it leads you around and about and is a great way of engaging your body in your meditation. If you live in any major urban area, there's probably a public labyrinth somewhere. But if there isn't a public labyrinth handy, or as an alternative, there are things called finger labyrinths. They're often on like a piece of wood or other kind of board. They're painted or etched or somehow emblazoned on that, that plaque. And you take your finger and you trace the pattern 
going back and forth and around and about and going around in the labyrinth till you reach the center. That's a really helpful tactile way of engaging in meditation. See, it's helpful if you're dealing with anxiety or, you know, other disorders to include more of your senses in meditation. That can be very beneficial. The third key is that 20 minutes may be too much to start with. Everybody says start with 20 minutes. Do what you can, don't do what you can't. Maybe what's right for you is three or four minutes. That's fine. Do what you can do. Engage in it and slowly you'll build up your time. The important thing is beginning to do the practice. I talk more about this in the video, are you meditating in the right way? Remember that this time of meditation is about you and for you. So maybe you're going to begin with three minutes in the morning and three minutes in the evening or five minutes in the morning and evening. That's great. That much will help give you greater balance and stability as you're living with some mental health diagnoses. The important thing here is adapting meditation to work with you so that you can live in a healthier, fuller way. Most meditation teachers teach what they know and what works for them. They teach their own practice. Few meditation teachers have familiarity with the breadth of, of practices, let alone what's happening for you if you have some sort of mental health challenge. If you need some assistance, feel free to send me a direct message or an email. We can set up some time as a form of spiritual direction and I can help tailor meditation in a way that's going to work for you. Know that what's most important here is that you add more and more skills to help yourself live in an effective way with whatever mental health challenge you're facing. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video, share the video with others, leave me some comments, and thank you for your time on Spirituality Beyond Borders.